The United Kingdom is made up of four constituent countries, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, all police officers carry firearms. In the rest of the United Kingdom, police officers do not carry firearms, except in special circumstances. This originates from the formation of the Metropolitan Police Service in the 19th century, when police were not armed, partly to counter public fears and objections over armed enforcers as this had been previously seen due to the British Army maintaining order when needed. The arming of police in Great Britain is a perennial topic of debate. Most officers are instead issued with other items for personal defense, such as spitcuffs, extendable ASP baton, and incapacitant sprays such as PAVA or CS spray. While not firearms, incapacitant sprays are subject to some of the same rules and regulations as a projectile firing firearm under Section 5 of the Firearms Act 1968. The Police Service of Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Security Guard Service, Ministry of Defence Police, Civil Nuclear Constabulary, Belfast Harbour Police, Belfast International Airport Constabulary, and the Diplomatic Protection Group and Special Escort Group of the Metropolitan Police are issued firearms as a matter of routine. Every force also has a force firearms units, with armed response vehicles. In the year 2011 a Euro 12, there were 6,756 authorized firearms officers. 12,550 police operations in which firearms were authorized throughout England and Wales and five incidents where conventional firearms were used. Since 2004, police forces have increasingly been issuing tasers to authorized firearms officers for use against armed assailants. Tasers are considered by the authorities to be a non-lethal alternative to firearms. History, Ireland, Ireland's first organized police force, the Royal Irish Constabulary, was created in the early 19th century, after Ireland had been absorbed into the United Kingdom. Due to the amount of civil unrest and the threat from Irish nationalist Republican groups, the RIC was armed from the beginning. The RIC played a key role in fighting the Irish Republican Army during the Irish War of Independence, and was essentially a paramilitary police force. In 1922, the Irish Free State left the UK and set up its own unarmed police force. However, six of Ireland's counties remained within the UK as Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland, male members of Northern Ireland's police force, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, were armed from the beginning due to the threat from the IRA. The first female members were armed in 1993. Firearms were used routinely by the AUC during the Troubles and a number of people were killed by a UC firearms or plastic bullets during that time. In 2001 the AUC became the Police Service of Northern Ireland. It remained an armed police force, partly due to the continued threat from dissident Irish republicanism. Great Britain, police use of firearms in Great Britain has been a slow, controversial and developing process, as senior officers wanted their forces to still have the British bobby. Or Dixon of Doc Green effect on the community. In Great Britain during the Second World War, firearms were only carried while protecting 10 Downing Street and the royal family, but police were given many firearms in case of invasion. They were never taken on general patrol, partly because a revolver was usually issued without a holster, as holsters were in short supply because of the war. Training for the Webley and Scott revolvers usually consisted of firing six shots into pass. It was required that three shots had to be on target although loading of the actual weapon was not taught. On May 26, 1940, Scotland Yard issued a memorandum detailing the Metropolitan Police use of firearms in wartime. It was decided that even though the police was non-combatant, they would provide armed guards at sites deemed a risk from enemy sabotage, and would assist the British armed forces in the event of an invasion. On June 1, 1940, 3,500 Ross rifles, which had last seen service in 1916, and 72,384 rounds of .303 ammunition were received from the military and were distributed among police division. Rifles were also issued to the Port of London Authority Police. In 1948, after the Second World War, concerns were aired by the Home Office of the Police Force's role in another war on nuclear attack. 
To combat this it was decided that some of the forces would be lent Sten guns by the Ministry of Defense and a number of Lee Enfield No. 4 MK2s. These, along with revolvers and ammunition, were kept in secret depots around the United Kingdom, so every force had the weapons close and could get access to them when and if the time should come. Historically, officers on night patrols in some London divisions were frequently armed with Webley revolvers. These were introduced following the murder of two officers in 1884, although individual officers were able to choose whether to carry the weapons. Armed police were rare by the turn of the century, and were retired formally in July 1936. However, after the Battle of Stepney in 1911, Webley semi-automatics were issued to officers. From 1936, firearms could only be issued by a sergeant with good reason and only then to officers who had been trained in their usage. The issue of routine arming in Great Britain was raised after the 1952 Derek Bentley case, in which a constable was shot dead and a sergeant severely wounded, and again after the 1966 massacre of Braybrook Street, in which three London officers were killed. As a result, around 17% of officers in London became authorised to carry firearms. After the deaths of a number of members of the public in the 1980s fired upon by police, control was considerably tightened, many officers had their firearm authorization revoked, and training for the remainder was greatly improved. As of 2005, around 7% of officers in London are trained in the use of firearms. Firearms are also only issued to an officer under strict guidelines. To allow armed officers to respond rapidly to an incident, most forces have patrolling armed response vehicles. ARVs were modeled on the instant response cars introduced by the West Yorkshire Police in 1976, and were first introduced in London in 1991, with 132 armed deployments being made that year. Although largely attributable to a significant increase in the use of imitation firearms and air weapons, the overall increase in firearms crime between 1998-99 and 2002-03 has kept this issue in the spotlight. In October 2000, Nottinghamshire Police introduced regular armed patrols to the St Anne's and Meadows estates in Nottingham, in response to 14 drug-related shootings in the two areas in the previous year. Although the measure was not intended to be permanent, Patrols were stepped up in the autumn of 2001 after further shootings, after which the firearms crime declined dramatically. As of September 2004, all forces in England and Wales have access to tasers, but they may only be used by authorised firearms officers and specially trained units. The Police Federation have since called for all officers to be issued with tasers, with some public support. In 2010, Following the serious injury of an unnamed officer in a knife attack, the chairman of the Police Memorial Trust, Michael Winner stated that he had put up memorials to 44 officers and that he believed, it is almost certain that at least 38 of those, police officers would be alive had they been armed. In response, chairman of the Metropolitan Police Federation Peter Smith said, a lot of police officers don't want to be armed. We don't want a call to arms, I don't think that's necessary. Surveys by the Police Federation of England and Wales have continued to show police officers considerable resistance to routine arming. In the Federation's most recent officer arming survey, 82% of respondents were against the routine arming of police, although 43% supported an increase in the number of officers trained and authorised to use firearms. Legal status, the usage of firearms by the police is covered by statute, policy and common law. Authorized firearms officers may only carry firearms when authorized by an appropriate authorizing officer. The appropriate authorizing officer must be of the rank of inspector or higher. When working at airports, nuclear sites, on protection duties and deployed in armed response vehicles in certain areas, standing authority is granted to carry personal sidearms. All members of the Police Service of Northern Ireland have authority to carry a personal issue handgun as a matter of routine, both on duty and off. In all forces, usage of other weapons such as semi-automatic carbines requires further training and authorization. Semi-automatic carbines are stored in a locked armory inside armed response vehicles. Equipping of semi-automatic carbines rests on a judgment of the AFO. 
United Kingdom law allows the use of reasonable force to make an arrest or prevent a crime or to defend oneself. However, if the force used is fatal, then the European Convention of Human Rights only allows the use of force which is no more than absolutely necessary. Firearms officers may therefore only discharge their weapons to stop an imminent threat to life. ACPO policy states that use of a firearm includes both pointing it at a person and discharging it. As with all use of force in England and Wales, the onus is on the individual officer to justify their actions in court. Firearms used Different police forces use a variety of firearms. Although, for forces in England and Wales, guidance is provided from ACPO and the Home Office decisions on what weapons will be employed by an individual force largely rest with the Chief Constable. Notable Incidents According to an October 2005 article in The Independent, in the preceding 12 years, 30 people have been shot dead by police. The following are examples of shootings by British police officers. This figure presumably excludes those killed in Northern Ireland. During the Troubles in Northern Ireland, Royal Ulster Constabulary officers killed 30 civilians, 17 members of Irish Republican paramilitaries and four members of Loyalist paramilitaries. Fatal Incidents Note, the following does not include killings by police in Northern Ireland. In June 1980, Hostage Gail Kinchin and her unborn baby were killed in crossfire between West Midlands officers and her boyfriend. On August 24, 1985 John Shorthouse aged five was shot dead in a police raid on his home in Birmingham. The incident produced hostility towards the police over two days after John's death when a policewoman was dragged from her patrol car and beaten by youths. Following the Shorthouse case, West Midlands Police abandoned its practice of training rank-and-file officers for firearms duties and formed a specialist squad. On April 24, 1995 James Brady, 21, was shot dead in an ambush by police officers acting on a tip-off. He and three friends were thought to be about to steal from a club in Westerhope Village, near Newcastle. The torch he had been carrying was mistaken for a firearm. On April 28, 1995 a prisoner on day release, David Ewen, 38, was shot twice in the stomach by a police officer after he was spotted in a stolen sports car in Barnes, West London. He died in hospital three weeks later. On September 23, 1996 Damuid O'Neill, 27, a suspected IRA terrorist was hit and killed by ten bullets when officers raided his lodgings in Hammersmith, West London. An inquest ruled last year that the unarmed man was lawfully killed. On November 20, 1996 David Howell, 40, a mental health patient, was shot dead by police marksman when he ran amok with a knife in a Birmingham shop and took the manager hostage. An inquest jury later returned a verdict of lawful killing. On January 15, 1998 James Ashley, 39, was shot and killed by Sussex police while naked and unarmed during a drugs raid at his flat. The officer who fired the shots was cleared of any wrongdoing after a trial at the Old Bailey. On February 26, 1998 Michael Fitzgerald, 32, was shot in the chest by police in Bedford after a two-hour standoff. Neighbours had mistaken him for a burglar. It later emerged that he was in his own home and carrying a fake gun. On April 10, 1999 Devon and Cornwall police fatally shot Anthony Kitts in Falmouth. He was reported to have threatened officers with what they thought was a sniper rifle. It turned out to be an air rifle. An inquest in 2000 returned a verdict of lawful killing. In June 1999 Derek Bateman, 47, of Surrey was shot by a single bullet through the heart after his girlfriend went to a neighbor's house and telephoned the police telling them he was armed and had been threatening to shoot her. It was later determined that the weapon he had brandished at the police was an air pistol. On September 22, 1999 Harry Stanley, a painter and decorator, born in Belshill near Glasgow, was walking home when he was shot dead by two Metropolitan Police officers following an erroneous report that he was carrying a sawn-off shotgun in a plastic bag. The officers challenged Mr. Stanley from behind. As he turned to face them they shot him dead at a distance of five meters. 
it later emerged that the plastic bag actually contained a broken table leg that Stanley's brother had just fixed for him. Following numerous inquiries both officers were exonerated after six years of court cases and inquiries. It was found that neither officer was liable for criminal charges nor would face any disciplinary sanctions. However, the report did make notable recommendations to the police on the post-incident procedure to be followed after a shooting and about challenging members of the public from behind. On September 24, 2000 Kirk Davis, 30, died after being shot by a West Yorkshire police officer in Wakefield. He had an air rifle and had threatened a police officer earlier in the evening. On October 30, 2000 Patrick O'Donnell, 19, was shot by a Metropolitan Police officer after a siege at a house in Islington, North London, in which he took his mother and girlfriend hostage. On July 12, 2001 Mr Andrew Kernan, 37, a gardener from Wavertree in Liverpool was shot dead in the street by the second of two shots fired by officers of the Merseyside Police Force. The officers had been called to the scene by the victim's mother, Marie Kernan, who had also requested a psychiatric medical team attend her home because her schizophrenic son, Andrew Kernan, was being aggressive. At least four police officers from the Merseyside force went to Mrs. Kernan's flat but Andrew Kernan ran into the street, dressed in his pajamas, wielding a katana. Mr. Kernan slashed off the wing mirror of one of the police cars. After negotiating with him for 25 minutes and using CS gas, officers fired two shots. The second bullet hit Mr. Kernan in the chest and he died on the way to hospital. In the case of Andrew Kernan, the chief constable of Merseyside Police Norman Bettison took the unusual step of sending a handwritten letter to Marie Kernan with his apologies. The then Home Secretary David Blunkett ordered a review of how armed police were used, and the dead man's mother, Marie Kernan, 59, commented at the time, You don't kill somebody with a mental illness. I demand justice for Andrew and won't rest until I get an answer. However, a verdict of lawful killing was returned by the jury at Liverpool District Coroner's Court on December 9, 2004, and the coroner, Andre Rebello, praised the actions of the officers at the scene. The IPCA Commissioner for the North West, Mike Franklin, stated that the officers involved in this case were presented with a rapidly evolving scenario. Firearms officers at the scene acted bravely and the investigation has found no evidence that their actions fell below that required or expected of them. On April 30, 2005, as Rodney, from London, was shot dead by armed officers of the Metropolitan Police. In August 2007, Coroner Andrew Walker, sitting at Hornsey North London, said that a full inquest into Rodney's death could not be held because of the large number of redactions in police officers' statements. In July 2013 a judicial inquiry found that the authorized firearms officer who fired the fatal shots had no lawful justification for opening fire. The case was referred to the Crown Prosecution Service to determine whether a prosecution should be launched. On July 22, 2005, Jean Charles de Meneses, a Brazilian national living in London, was shot dead by unnamed Metropolitan Police officers on board an underground train at Stockwell Tube Station in the belief he was a suicide bomber. He was shot in the back of the head seven times. Initially, police claimed incorrectly that he was wearing bulky clothing and that he had vaulted the ticket barriers running from police when challenged, but did not modify their statement until the correct information was leaked to the press. They later issued an apology, saying that they had mistaken him for a suspect in the previous day's failed bombings and acknowledging that Demeanses in fact had no explosives and was unconnected with the attempted bombings. Following an investigation by the Independent Police Complaints Commission, the Crown Prosecution Service announced on July 17, 2006, that no charges would be brought against any individual officers in relation to the death of Jean Charles. Sir Ian Blair Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police when the shooting occurred will, however, face charges under health and safety legislation from his professionale euro rather than personale euro capacity. The family of John Charles has called on the government to open a public inquiry into the shooting. In June 2007 Anne Sanderson was shot dead by an armed officer in Seven Oaks, Kent after being seen with what was later identified as a BB gun which she refused to relinquish when challenged by police. 
It was the first fatal shooting of a woman by UK police in 27 years. A month previously police officers had found notes in Sanderson's car which had suicidal connotations, but no action was taken. A subsequent IPCC investigation noted this, as well as other procedural issues in the investigation, but stated that they did not have a negative impact on the incident's outcome. In addition, the report said that officers involved performed their duties conscientiously and diligently, and that an inquest jury returned a verdict of lawful killing. On August 4, 2011, Mark Duggan was shot dead by the MPS, sparking massive riots across London. Four officers are being investigated in the incident, although it was speculated in leaks from official sources to the Times newspaper. That the firearms officer, would be cleared of any wrongdoing on the basis that he had an honest held belief that he was in imminent danger of him or his colleagues being shot. On March 3, 2012, Anthony Griner was shot dead in Cheshire by an armed Greater Manchester police officer whilst sitting in a stolen car. Griner was unarmed at the time of the shooting. Chief Constable Peter Fye was charged under health and safety legislation over the shooting. Non-fatal incidents, note. The following does not include incidents in Northern Ireland. On January 17, 1983 Stephen Waldorf was shot by police hunting David Martin, who absconded from custody at Marlborough Street Magistrates Court where he was due to face a charge of attempting to murder a police officer. Waldorf was critically injured in a police ambush in a West London street after he was mistaken for Martin. He was shot five times and then pistol whipped by an officer who had attempted to shoot him in the head, but had already used all his ammunition. Waldorf made a full recovery and eventually received compensation. On September 28, 1985 Cherry Gross, a mother of six, was shot and paralyzed by officers looking for her son. The shooting sparked riots in Brixton. The officer involved was cleared of all criminal charges. On June 2, 2006, Two family homes were raided in an operation involving 250 police in East London. One man, Abdul Kaha, was shot in the shoulder by police during the raid, but was later released without charge. The raid was based on faulty intelligence. Shoot to kill policy, the national media has criticized the so-called shoot to kill policy adopted by police forces. Police firearms training actually teaches the use and discharge of firearms to remove the threat rather than to kill. Following the September 11, 2001 attacks new guidelines were developed for identifying, confronting, and dealing forcefully with terrorist suspects. These guidelines were given the code name Operation Kratos. Based in part on advice from the security forces of Israel and Sri Lanka Euro 2 countries with experience of suicide bombings a Euro Operation Kratos guidelines allegedly state that the head or lower limbs should be aimed at when a suspected suicide bomber appears to have no intention of surrendering. This is contrary to the usual practice of aiming at the torso, which presents the biggest target, as a hit to the torso may detonate an explosive belt. Sir Ian Blair appeared on television July 24, 2005 to accept responsibility for the error on the part of the Metropolitan Police in shooting Jean Charles de Meanses, mistakenly identified as a suicide bomber three days prior, and to acknowledge and defend the policy, saying that there is no point in shooting at someone's chest because that is where the bomb is likely to be. There is no point in shooting anywhere else if they fall down and detonate it. See also Anti-terrorist policies of the Metropolitan Police, shoot to kill policy in Northern Ireland. References. External links, Tactical Firearms Unit. Specialist Units. Sussex Police. Retrieved January 5, 2010 A.